Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. There is no end to the good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. Is a quote from General Colin Powell, the American statesman and retired four-star general who has also served as National Security Advisor Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and during President George W. Bush's first administration, Secretary of State. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest, an American diplomat who went on to serve at the Council on Foreign Relations and the U.S. Department of State as Senior Coordinator for International Women's Issues, working with Secretary Powell and President Bush. Our guest today is April Palmley, Chief Executive Officer of the American Chamber of Commerce in Australia, or AMCHAM, with a quarter of all foreign direct investment in Australia coming from the United States, it is one of the most significant international business organisations in Australia, promoting two-way trade and investment, standing up for business for 60 years. April is also a director of the Centre for Independent Studies and Georgetown University Centre for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies. She previously worked for the University of Sydney's U.S. Studies Centre, the Lowy Institute for International Policy, and renowned couturier Oscar de la Renta. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners and followers from all over the world, please don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. And for our listeners in Spain, Japan, and the United States, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In today's episode, April speaks to us about the unique connection between the US and Australia, one that transcends the confines of big screens and boardrooms. We also hear about her career that has seen her in government, education and corporate in the United States, Middle East and Australia. Finally, she shares with us the fascinating link between Oscar de la Renta and Dr. Henry Kissinger, a rare insight into the inner workings of Washington, D.C. So sit back and enjoy the true ally amongst friends. April, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Where's that accent from, April? I've been in Australia for 18 years. It is from the United States originally. Whereabouts did you grow up? Just outside Washington, D.C. in a suburb in Maryland. Washington, D.C. What did mom and dad do? They were probably some of the only people who weren't part of the government. My dad was a, an investor in real estate, and my mom stayed home and looked after us like a lot of moms of that generation. You went to a pretty interesting school. I was doing some homework on that school. Yeah, yeah, I was really fortunate. It was a prep school, like the one that I have my daughters in here in Sydney. And we were all expected to go out and get jobs when we finished there. It, it was not a finishing school, although people like Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis went there long ago. But in my year, we had um, the daughter of a Burmese diplomat, a princess from Jordan, the child of a hotel group, um, a lot of really different people. And just this weekend, I was reflecting on what a diverse group of girls I grew up with. I just took it for granted that people from all different cultures and countries could come together and be educated together and be friends. And it wasn't until I left school that I realized that 
places were really much more separate than I had grown up with. And you just said you weren't expected to get jobs. Has things changed? Well, at this particular school, they did expect us to get jobs. Everybody from my class went to university, but certainly the generation before that was brought up with the idea that one income would support the family, and that was usually the husband. But almost all the girls who I went to school with now are doctors or lawyers or professors, researchers. They all have pretty interesting careers. Well, you took an interesting step. I, I read you studied Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service, International Relations and Affairs. What made you go down that path? Well, growing up in Washington, D.C., I was fascinated by politics and international affairs and things like English, history, languages. Those were my favorite subjects, and that was what I was surrounded by in my day-to-day -day life. And then when it came time for university, I decided that I wanted to study to go into the Foreign Service, the Diplomatic Corps. Okay. And Georgetown University had the top school for that, the School of Foreign Service in Washington, D.C. And as a matter of fact, the current acting ambassador here in, in Australia and the consul general in Sydney, we were all in school together. Oh, really? There are a lot of people from not only that class, but that school that are out doing interesting things in, in international affairs. So. I had professors like Madeleine Albright and Jean Kirkpatrick, Henry Kissinger, wow. real practitioners. Because the school was right in Washington, D.C., we had the opportunity to learn from real masters. And it was also a Jesuit university, so there was a lot of teaching about the Christian faith, Catholic understanding of, of how people should interact with the world. And after university, I went down to Nicaragua and did some work with the Jesuits down there. That would be interesting times in those days. Absolutely. I had written my thesis on the Contras. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yes. Um, so getting down there. So this, oh, this is just after Oliver North. Oliver North and the, and yes, the Contras game. Exactly right. Wow. So getting down there and seeing people in person, and you get a different sense than when you're yeah. sitting in Washington reading books and, yeah. and newspapers. You get down there and you get dirt under your fingernails and travel on buses with people and understand what their lives are like. What really struck you? How passionate people were. Really, they believed in their cause. They were willing to die for it. And it wasn't just a policy like it is in Washington, D.C. When you're sitting at arm's length, they were living it every day. And it was a lot more dangerous and immediate than it feels when you're further away. And were you always going to then pursue a career in foreign affairs? Because there's a couple of little sidesteps along the way, it looks like. Yeah, um, I did think I wanted to go into foreign affairs, and I had the choice to take the exam to go into the foreign service. I decided not to do that because I wanted to move to New York for personal reasons, and so I went to work at the Spanish Institute, which was similar to a government agency, but um, using the Spanish that I had learned in school. I, I studied Spanish. I had become fluent in Portuguese by that point. So I wanted to use those languages, and working at the Spanish Institute allowed me to do that and to get a little bit more deeply involved in the European side of things, since I had mostly focused on Latin America during high school and college. And that led to a, um, a very interesting next role? Yeah, one of the board members at the Spanish Institute uh, was Oscar de la Renta. He was a very famous fashion designer from the Dominican Republic, and one day he rang up the office and said, April, my EA is moving to Ireland to get married and I need a new EA. And I said, okay, Mr. De La Renta, what, what are your requirements? And I wrote everything down and I said, I'll, I'll let you know if we can think of anybody. And I went in to tell the, the head of the Spanish Institute, Mr. De La Renta is looking for someone. And she said, April, he wants you, but he can't poach you because he's on the board here. Oh, He'd like you to volunteer. So I said, well, I'm not sure I want to go work for a dressmaker. I, I'm going to be a diplomat. And she said, stop and think. International business people have more power than ambassadors right now. And so I did a little research and I thought, she's right. He has a lot of businesses, a lot of things happening around the world. And I got to travel around the world with him. Turned out that his best friend, his next door neighbor in Connecticut was Henry Kissinger. Are you kidding? So one day he was asked to deliver the commencement speech for his son. He had an orphanage in the Dominican Republic and he adopted a little boy who had been uh, left out on the street 
This yeah. was one of the children at the orphanage, and Oscar actually adopted this little boy and named him Moises. And Moises went to the Kent Academy in Connecticut, and Oscar was asked to give the commencement speech, and I worked on it for him. And he said, well, that looks good, but why don't you see what Dr. Kissinger says? So I sent the speech to Dr. Kissinger, and Dr. Kissinger called me on the phone and gave me some pointers on my speech writing. And I stopped and I thought, if I had gone straight through to the Foreign Service, I'd probably be stamping visas in Beijing, not mm -hmm. having the most famous influential Secretary of State ever critiquing Absolutely. my speech writing. So I really think that was a moment when it dawned on me that you can take a step off what you think is your intended career track and it can have positive effects. The things that I learned from Oscar, I'm still using today. I sat in his office and heard him call Henry Kravis and Pete Peterson and Steve Schwartzman and convince them to donate to the causes that were important to him. I listened to how he did that. I saw how he seated dinner parties, right. where the guest of honor goes, who gives the first toast, uh, who walks in with who, all kinds of things that I hadn't been exposed to before that I just picked up through osmosis from him, as well as picking up a few dresses and a little bit better fashion sense than I had growing up in a plaid skirt and a white blouse. What about the creative side as a, as a leader? What did you observe there? That creative people think very differently yeah. from engineers and mathematicians. It was a really different kind of an approach. I'm a very organized, methodical person. And being in a room with people who think much more laterally and see lots of different connections was very exciting, very powerful. And I thought this is good to have both kinds of people because if you just have the creatives there, some things don't get done. And if you just have the, the organized doers, you know, other things don't get done. And I've brought that forward as well. For example, we took a delegation to the United States before COVID. And we had a lot of CEOs and chairmen coming along, but I specifically okay. went out to get an artist, to get somebody from the military, to get different kinds of people to join in because I knew I got a headmaster from a school. Oh, really? I, I tried to get different viewpoints because I had seen the power of bringing those different kinds of thought processes together, and it worked very well. Also, he's an entrepreneur too, isn't he, Oscar? Oscar was a great entrepreneur. So, not so, yes. So that's all about risk-taking, isn't it? He tried all different kinds of things. You know, he was very good with the dresses. He did Erin um, Lauder, Estee Lauder's granddaughter. When she got married, he did her dress. He did one of the Miller daughter's dresses. He did a lot of the movie star's dresses. But he also branched out. He started doing fragrance. He yeah. did menswear. He did luggage. He did all sorts of franchises. And some of them worked. Some of them didn't. But he took risks. He challenged himself. He tried new things. And... That was the way that you did it in New York. It was failure part of the vocabulary for someone like that? I don't think failure is a part of the vocabulary. I think it's learning. And you've just figured out one way that doesn't work. It doesn't mean that you failed. You tried something and you tried something else. You've got quite a remarkable career, April, because you then change again industry. This next time is banking. How did that come about and what were you focused on then? Again, it was a personal connection that took me north of the border. I moved up to Montreal, which is in the province of Quebec in Canada. And Canada, U.S. have a similar relationship to Australia, New Zealand. But Canada has the added complexity of being a bilingual country. So I was living in Quebec at a time when the Quebecois were keen to separate from the rest of Canada. And my job at this publisher was to analyze what would happen to the Canadian dollar if Quebec separated from the rest of Canada, and it was not a pretty picture. So I was very pleased when the referendum in 1995 turned out 49.9 to 50.1 and was defeated. It was extremely close, but they haven't brought it up again since. Yeah, well. And then you what, joined a think tank, is that correct? Is that, is that the terminology I should use? That's right. Back on my path to, yeah. to being in international affairs. Okay. And you're based in New York. That's right. Back and, to New York. And you're based in New York in September 11th. I was. September so, 11th, 2001. Where, um, where were you? This is really interesting, actually. I had been on maternity leave. I had my first child in June 2001. And... A friend of mine said, don't go back from your mat leave on a Monday. 
go back on a Tuesday because you don't want to have a long week the first week you're back after having the baby. So I said, okay, I'm going to start work on Tuesday, September 11th. And I was having a celebratory breakfast with a friend of mine. He was a banker who worked on Wall Street. He had come uptown to take me to breakfast to welcoming me back to the working world after having the baby. And we had breakfast. And then I went into my office. And I was meant to fly to Washington that day because I was going to work for President Bush. And I went into my office and I called the White House and I said, just confirming I'm getting on a flight to come down. And they said, hang on. Have you turned on the TV? And I said, no, what happened? And they said, the president's about to go on television. A plane's just hit the World Trade Center. You better hold off. And none of us really knew what was happening at that point. I thought, well, how does this have anything to do with my job if a little Cessna clips the World Trade Center? Of course, then it all unfolded. So I was inside the Council on Foreign Relations as this continued to unfold. Now, that's uptown on Park Avenue and 68th Street. The World Trade Center is down at the bottom of Manhattan, but we didn't know what was coming next. Yeah. So there were snipers on our roof looking out for terrorists, the same as at the United Nations. We didn't know if we should leave the building and try and go home or if we were safe or staying there. All the communications got cut off. You couldn't make a phone call. Here I was the first day leaving my baby to go to work, and I couldn't get the nanny on the phone to find out if they were okay. All right. Eventually, we decided everybody was better off going home. I lived 40 blocks from uh, where I worked, okay. and I was in remnant of Oscar days. I was in my Manolo Blahniks and, and a suit, and I had to walk 40 blocks back to my house because it wasn't safe to get in the subway. We didn't know if there'd be a sarin gas attack, so everything was closed. Everything was gridlocked. There was no communication. So it was just masses and masses of people walking up the avenues trying to buy some water or toilet paper or whatever they could get as they went home to hunker down and see what came next. So you made it home that night, okay? Made it home that night, and we decided that our office was going to open the next day. The president of the Council on Foreign Relations decided that the best and safest thing to do was to carry on. That's what New Yorkers did. The next day, we got in the subway. It was working again. We went into the office. Everybody's mind was elsewhere, but we tried to have a normal day and not let the terrorists close the city down. And it was a good decision. Courageous. It was. Um, that's. I think that's where character really shows. When there is no script, there's no defined way that you need to react. You need to make your own decisions, keep your people safe, show leadership. And that's that's part of why President Bush had such high popularity ratings after he was elected. Um, and I think the president of the Council on Foreign Relations did a brilliant job that day also. So how did the appointment come about to go into Mr. Bush's administration? And, and what were you tasked to do? I was offered the position of Senior Coordinator for International Women's Issues. That's now called Ambassador at Large for Women's Issues. It was the equivalent of an Assistant Secretary at, at the Department of State. And when I was offered the job, I thought there would be a lot to do with microfinance and reproductive rights and girls' education. That was kind of what the office did. And then, as I said, right before I started, we got hit. Yeah. September 11th happened, the Taliban hit, and the war on terror started. So by the time I got sworn in and I was working for President Bush at the State Department, the focus had shifted very much to Afghanistan. Yep. And women and girls in Afghanistan, um, the human rights issues there were appalling. Yeah, deplorable. Um, there were girls who were seven, eight, nine years old who had never been to school, women who couldn't have jobs or leave their households without a male member of their family accompanying them. So that very much became the focus of the work. But it was different to what I thought when I was offered the job. And it was even more interesting, of course, but it, it was another lesson for me that you never know what you're going to be doing when you say yes to something. It could change dramatically between the time that you accept the position and you actually get started. So where did it take you? What did you actually see in real life? Some of the most interesting things were going to the Middle East. I went to Jordan and we campaigned to try and stop honor killings. Honor killings are a process by which a woman who is accused or suspected of adultery 
is stoned to death by her own community or family. And we felt like Jordan was probably one of the um, countries with enlightened leadership that might be interested in talking to us about how we could work together to change that process. I also went to Yemen, which was very dangerous for a female American diplomat, but I had great support and met some fascinating people and, and started to understand a little bit about what their lives were like there and how the U.S. could support them. One of the really interesting shifts, Greg, was going from the think tank where we produced white papers and made speeches and urged politicians to do this and that, to being in office, in government with a staff and a budget and being able to carry these things out. And the interesting thing was how the urgent drives out the important every day of the week. There was always a crisis going on and it wasn't the same luxury that we had in New York of sitting back and thinking strategically about things and plotting them out in an essay. Yeah. It was very much on the fly, things happening all the time, people moving around, different leaders being available. I remember I was in a taxi with the Minister for Women's Affairs. We were in Barcelona going from one conference to another and we shared a taxi. And I said something to her about why aren't there more women on the Constitutional Council? They were rewriting the, the Afghan Constitution, and there there had been a lot of female lawyers in Afghanistan previously. And I said, why aren't there more women on the council? And she said, that's a good question. I've been pushing President Karzai for that. And then later on, I heard that they had appointed more women to the council at the urging of the U.S. government. And I You're thought, right. how interesting. You know, this is just a conversation in the back of a taxi, but it did lead to to some change, some some positive change. So I was really happy to see that. Of course, sometimes you work and work and, and you don't get anything done, but it's really validating to see sometimes the policies that you're pushing for can can happen and make a difference. Do I want your help if I'm sitting in the Middle East? Do I want the US to come and give me advice on how we have to, I need to change current culture? That's a good question. And it was something that we grappled with, how to help the people who were there in the context of the culture that they were in. So for example, the women who weren't supposed to leave their home compounds, how could we help them without disrupting their lives? Yeah. How could we help ensure their human rights and allow them to provide for their families? Because if, if you're cutting half the population out of the working culture, then the country's not going well, the families aren't going well, you're really disadvantaging everyone there. So we did a lot of microfinance. We helped women set up bakeries and weaving communes in their houses. We helped them set up schools within their compounds for the girls to learn. We also built schools for the girls. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been bombed since. But um, we were very sensitive to the challenges. When we asked for donations for the schools in Afghanistan, things like Barbie dolls got donated, which was very generous, but not what they wanted or needed in their culture. So as we became more entrenched there, um, one of the things that we delivered was a school pack. And I still have one of these. I show it to my children sometimes. It had a slate, you know, a, a blackboard yep. with some chalk. Oh, yep. Yep. And it had a quill. It was a, um, a piece of bamboo, a hollowed out piece of bamboo with a diagonal cut at the end a small plastic bottle filled with dried ink crystals. So they would add some water to the little bottle, shake it up to make the ink, dip their bamboo in there, and write. This is in 2001. Yeah, all of 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. There was a top, a spinning top, a skipping rope, and some pencils. And this, this was what they needed and wanted, and they were thrilled to get it. So it took us a few iterations to figure out exactly what was appropriate and necessary, but we were able to deliver in the end, and, and it's an iterative process. Hey, but when you chart this course, and you're doing it for what you believe is the right reason, have you always got hope? Do you think you're getting pushed back a lot? President Bush very firmly believed in uh, human rights as part of uh, the U.S. mandate in terms of foreign affairs. So 
there were basic human rights that yeah. were being violated and that that was what we sought to change education freedom of movement things like that we we weren't trying to impose an american culture on a different culture but trying to ensure that basic human rights were acknowledged and protected and you went with uh, mrs bush on one one tour mrs bush did come with us to afghanistan which was incredible both president and mrs bush were very interested in the girls education side of what we were doing in afghanistan and uh, you can imagine it was a big logistical exercise to bring a, such an important person to a war zone. Um, when we were there, we stayed uh, on the U.S. Embassy compound in a container, you know, the big metal containers. Those were fitted out as accommodation for us, and there were streets you couldn't go on. But we, we got out, and sometimes people came in. I met some seamstresses, some accountants, just regular people who came in to talk to us about what their life was like, what they needed, how we could help. And having a leader like the president or Mrs. Bush on the ground there talking to Afghans really brought it home for them the same way that I was talking about going to Nicaragua after writing my paper. It informs your decision making when you're back in Washington, D.C. And we were so fortunate that she showed so much interest. One of the groups that we set up while we were there was the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. And that continues to this day. That provides opportunities for women in business. During times of war, so you're, you're, you're living in the most incredible time and you're getting exposed to the most incredible things. What's the learning or what's the view when you see the likes of Colin Powell, President Bush operate? As you say, it must have been frenetic. How do they make decisions? How do they operate? They're very different leaders. President Bush had an MBA. He was very methodical and he ran meetings very well. That's quite a skill. When we were in the White House, seeing him running the meetings was extremely impressive. General Powell brought his experience as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as an Army general, to the State Department and very much like today with, I think, another leader who you've interviewed, Gus McLaughlin, who's now in the private sector. People who've been in the military are really good at crisis and project management. When things like COVID hit, the experiences that they have in, in leading, in bringing the troops along and giving them a purpose and a destination and an explanation are really helpful. So Secretary Powell was a terrific chief diplomat. Secretary Rumsfeld was at the Defense Department at that point, and he and Secretary Powell had very robust discussions about whether it was a, a diplomatic or military exercise, our, our involvement in Afghanistan. And President Bush was able to, to bring everybody together. So I learned uh, quite a lot from both of those leaders, as well as my direct supervisor, uh, Ambassador Paula Dobryansky, who was the undersecretary there. She was in charge of everything from global warming to Tibet, a lot of really tricky issues, and she navigated them brilliantly. So I, I loved learning from her. And from that experience, I've said to young people, don't worry about what your title is. Think about who you're reporting to and go and work for somebody who is going to teach you something, who you're going to learn from, who you want to be like, and don't worry about what it says your job is. How much do you reckon you changed during this period of time? It's hard to say, isn't it? I think mm. well, we're, we're things, changing every day. Yeah, but you're, you're being exposed to some of the harshest things in the world, aren't you? But it was a dream come true. It was the job that I had always wanted. Being appointed by the president to do something that important was exactly what I was hoping for. And it was wonderful to actually be inside the government. One of the things I've seen in other countries is you, you're either in the government or you're not. You don't move back and forth like we do in America. Yeah. And so being able to bring my private sector experience into government and then coming out of government back into the private sector, I think that helped me grow a lot as a leader and understand the challenges on both sides to a greater extent than I had before. Are you more cynical? I'd say I'm more hopeful. Okay. Well, on that then, so how does it feel watching all the Americans and the Australians starting to pull out, almost pulled out now out of Afghanistan? It's been 20 years. It's been our longest engagement. And... This is one of the things President Biden promised he would do. The American people are behind it. And we will continue to advise and, and offer the support we can. But 
this is the decision that the president has taken and I'm not in a position to second guess him. I'm not there. I'm not seeing what he's seeing, but apparently this is what um, the American people want. It's time to, to pull back. Why might you come to Australia? Well, I was really enjoying my role with the State Department, but my husband was working for the investment bank at JP Morgan in Hong Kong. And we were flying back and forth every six or eight weeks. Oh, you're, you're doing the long distance relationship. We were, and we thought we were a modern family and we'd be able to do it and it would be fine, but it was pretty hard, 12 hours difference. So somebody was always in the office and somebody was always at home. So it's kind of awkward to have a conversation. And with me flying off to Afghanistan or Turkey or Mexico or wherever I was going, we had a little two-year-old. So that was tricky. And um, my father said to me, he was in the hospital, he was dying. And he said, April, you need to choose between your career and your family. And I said, but daddy, this is a presidential appointment. Yeah. Uh, he said, you can get another job. Did he really? Yep. You can't get another family. Go be with your family. So I moved to Hong Kong. We were there during SARS, funny enough, you know, and here we are living through COVID. Remember the SARS and um, the bird flu? Yes. So Hong Kong wasn't the greatest place to live at that time with a young child. And JP Morgan offered my husband the opportunity to come here to Australia. And sight unseen, he'd never been to Australia. He said, sure, let's do it. There's another risk taker for you. <laughs> okay. And we came here. We thought it would be a year or two, and then we'd be on the road to the next expat location, but we fell in love. How long have you been here for now? 18 years. Wow. We're dual citizens now. Now, you started in the Center for Independent Studies. That's another think tank, is it? It is a think tank, yeah. They brought me on there as their um, visiting fellow for U.S. foreign policy. So I, I wrote and gave lectures about the U.S. foreign policy. There was... A very wise man there named Owen Harris at the time, who I learned a lot from, and Helen Hughes was on the staff. She taught me a lot about the Aboriginal issues here in Australia, and I really enjoyed getting to know Australia through the think tank. It was um, a good way for me to get connected to the policies and the programs that were happening here. Mr. Lowy, big supporter of it? Well, that was actually separate. Frank Lowy wanted to set up the Lowy Institute. Okay for international policy at about that time. And it was very much modeled on the Council on Foreign Relations where I'd worked in New York. And I was probably the only person from the Council on Foreign Relations in Sydney at that time. So the Lowy Institute brought me on board to give them some advice about a few different parts of how they were setting up the Institute. And I've stayed interested in their work ever since they're doing a great job. They've just celebrated their anniversary as well. They're just behind the AmCham. We're neighbors. Okay. Now, what is Pink Skirt Productions? When I took a break from my career to raise our four children, I took up running. I became an ultra marathoner and I met all different kinds of people in the running world. Sydney Striders is the biggest running club in Australia. I became their vice president and there were people in that group who were incredibly successful in their careers. There were also people who couldn't afford a car. Just all different kinds of people brought together through a love of running. Yeah. And I thought there aren't enough ultramarathons that everybody can get to that are accessible to people who don't have cars and <laughs> can't drive to the mountains. And so I created uh, Pink Skirt Productions. So I set up the Centennial Park Ultra an ultra marathon in Centennial Park. So right in the middle of the city, running 26 laps of the white fence there. I set up a run in the Southern Highlands oh, wow. that had 100, 50, 20, 10, and one kilometer for the little babies to run um, in Wingelow State Forest. And uh, I was race director for the uh, six foot track, which oh, yeah. goes from the Explorer's Cave Absolutely. in Blue Mountains. Um, 46 kilometers. Yep. That was the vehicle for me to do all of these runs. They were all not-for-profit runs um, that gave donations to uh, one of them supported the Achilles Foundation, which 
has guides for blind runners. Do you right. ever think about that? How do yeah. blind people run? Yep. They have to have a guide with them who yep. is connected. So I supported the Achilles Foundation and the Rural Fire Service with our runs. It was a great, a great experience. I enjoyed it tremendously. And, and the community spirit in Australia and the running community was really exciting. You do a lot of thinking when you run. Is that the time? Exactly right. That is when my brain goes on the pleasing blue screen. <laughs> um, some people meditate. Some people do other things. Um, we had a, an expert on neuroplasticity come in and speak at AmCham. And she asked the group, when do you get your best thoughts? When do you do your best thinking? And one guy put his hand up and he said, in the shower. And somebody else said, on the exercise bike. And somebody else said, when I'm meditating. Nobody said, when I'm sitting at my desk. Very, very true, isn't it? That's exactly right. So I figured, you know, if, I, if I've got a problem in my life and I don't work out the answer in a four-hour run on Sunday, there is no answer. Is it a four-hour run you do every Sunday? It, it varied, yeah. I, I put in about 120 kilometers a week. And I slouch then? It was my way of relaxing. I really enjoyed it. And my knees and my back held up okay. So I felt really fortunate. We have beautiful places to run here in Australia. It's a great way to get to know a new place. What's a bit of competitive in instinct there? Yes, certainly. We always try and do our best. And, and actually, women do better in the ultramarathons. Our bodies are more suited. I, I ran an ultramarathon in South Africa called the Comrades. Oh, yep. Yeah. You've done that one, have you? Yeah, yeah. How'd you go? I did really well. I had nine and a half hours. Wow. Um, but one year, it's an up year, they say. And one year, a down year. Now, now, it goes up and down the whole way in both directions. It's through the mountains. But um, it's a net decrease in elevation in the down year. And they say that women do that better because our hips are wider. We have a, a better center of gravity to distribute our weight as we land. And so we're less sore at the end of that race than men are typically. So right. The men, they say, have to go up the stairs to the plane backwards because their hamstrings are so tight. Yeah, that's, I, I, I've done some running a long time ago. I think you're 100% right there. Yeah. Now, how did AmCham come about? How did the CEO role of AmCham come about? I went to work at the U.S. Study Center at yep. the University of Sydney on a maternity leave cover, and that was during the 2016 election. It was one of our more exciting elections. That was when President Trump got elected, and Australians are so interested in U.S. politics. There was a poll, Pew Research did a poll on how interested are you in the U.S. presidential election, and 83% of Americans said very interested. 87% of Australians said very interested. Yeah. And I was amazed how much Australians knew not only about their own politics, their economy, what their government spends taxes on, but how much they knew about the American system. I was really, really impressed. That got me excited about working in that area. And I had been involved with AmCham. Uh, my husband had been a governor there. I'd been a speaker. The U.S. Study Center was a member of AmCham. Um, so I had a fair bit to do with them. And when this position was offered, I thought, gosh, that's perfect for me. I know they've never had a female CEO before. I don't think they've ever hired anybody under 50. I don't think anybody's been a dual citizen. The guy before me was former ambassador, U.S. Ambassador Niels Marquardt. And before him, it was an Australian named Charles Blunt, who used to be the head of the National Party. That's right. So there were a lot of firsts, and I thought, that's really exciting. I'd love to see what I can do there. So for those listening who don't know AmCham, what is AmCham, and what are you going to do? That's a good question. There are 120 AmCham's around the world. AmCham stands for the American Chamber of Commerce. Here in Australia, we have five offices, and they all report to me, and I report to a single board. That varies from country to country. For example, in China, there are four AmChams, but they're all separate. There's a Shanghai AmCham and a Beijing AmCham and a Taiwan AmCham and a Hong Kong AmCham. We're very fortunate here that we're all united because we are a, a small population despite it being a big country. But the reason that there are AmChams in 120 countries is because American business is global and there are American businesses all over the world. And AmChams exist to increase two-way trade and investment between the United States and these other countries where they exist. I think AmCham Philippines is one of the oldest ones that was set up in 1898. Right. The AmCham in Australia was set up in 1961. So we're celebrating 60 years here. 
And we help American companies who want to come to Australia and expand. I hope there'll be more. And Australian companies that are either already working in the U.S. or want to go and work in the U.S. And again, we're hoping there'll be even more. So it's very much two-way? Very much two-way. You know, the U.S. is the biggest investor in Australia, but the U.S. is also the biggest destination for outbound Australian investment. So it's a two-way street. And despite the U.S. having a much bigger population, a much bigger economy, Australia really punches above its weight in terms of how much it invests in the U.S. April, what's the sort of numbers that the U.S. does invest in Australia? Well, there's over a trillion dollars in investment here and two trillion if you count all the trade that goes on as well. So it's quite a big number. When you compare that, for example, with the UK, which is the second biggest investor, they invest, uh, they've invested about 535 billion. So Far just less. about half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. China is about 10th at about 65 billion. Their investment here peaked in 2016 at 16 and a half billion that year. Wow. And what about the other way going into the US? Going into the U.S., it's almost the same. It's um, about $700 billion going into the U.S., and that comes a lot from the super funds and the infrastructure. Yeah, you'd be surprised. That's that's what I mean about punching above its weight, that yeah. Australia really delivers. Yeah, we, what are we sitting about 14th in the world or 4th in the world in capital? Exactly right. Yeah, we have the 55th largest population, 14th biggest economy, but the third or fourth biggest pool of capital because of the compulsory superannuation here. There is a lot of money to invest and limited places to invest it in Australia. So the money goes looking elsewhere for returns. And the United States is a logical place given the security there, the intellectual property rights, the rule of law all of the things that, that we have here in Australia that we know we can count on it if we invest our money in the United States. April, what does the Biden administration stand for? Well, President Biden was elected with four priorities to turn around what had happened with the COVID virus. Obviously, it was running rampant in the last days of the Trump administration. So that was his main priority was to get the virus under control. A related priority was to stimulate the economy because the U.S. economy, like all economies around the world, had suffered a severe contraction yep. in the wake of the shutdown. Another problem that he said he would address is the racial injustice. We've seen a lot of protests starting with the Black Lives Matter, but then moving through many other incidents, and he wanted to address that. And finally, climate change has been very important for him. And we've seen that in his appointment of former Secretary of State John Kerry as his climate czar, his head of national security, Avril Haines, saying that the climate change is the center of national security for the Biden administration. So those were really the four things that he wanted to stand for, that he wanted to fix, that he wanted to change. All new presidents are judged on what they get done in the first 100 days. That's considered the honeymoon okay. for an American president. That's, that's when you get everything that you want. You try and push it through in those first 100 days while your popularity is high. Yep. And he has been able to ride that popularity, although it hasn't been quite as high as some of his predecessors. He has been more popular than his immediate predecessor, Donald Trump. So he has pushed through some of his plans, others are, are waiting in the wings, but he's been very disciplined, highly disciplined in these first hundred days. And I think that's a result of the people who he's brought on. Most of the people who are in his administration were either in the Clinton or Obama administrations. Yeah, right. And so they have lived through the experience where during the midterm elections, two years after the presidential elections, they've lost the house. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's a limited window here in their experience to get, get things done and they're trying to move quickly. Also, because people are dying, obviously, with the COVID virus, there's that Im imperative as well. Well, I was just going to ask you, April, where are we up to with regards to the um, the vaccine rollout? This is such a success story, Greg. It's amazing. America has been vaccinating over 3 million people a day since the beginning of April. A day? A day. 30 million people in a week. Do we lose sight of Mr. Trump pushing that very hard to get it to that point pre-hand? Project Warp Speed? Yeah. 
It, it all builds on what was done before, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. the ingenuity of the American and the Australian companies that collaborated on the R&D, it's, it's important to recognize everything that's gone into getting us where we are. And we may be reaching the saturation point of Americans who want to get vaccinated. Sure. Um, there, there aren't lines anymore. There aren't any queues. You can walk in and get get your shot in a lot of places. It's been rolled out to all sorts of pharmacies and supermarkets and lots and lots of places where you can go and get vaccinated. So I think we're going to reach herd immunity soon in the United States. Obviously, there'll continue to be other variants like we've seen with the ones coming out of different countries. They'll be stronger in different variants. And we think that COVID's going to be around for a long time. It's going to be like the flu. It's something you're going to need to get a shot for every year. Yeah. And we're going to have to get used to the idea of people having COVID. You know, we'll say, oh, uh, poor Pat, he's got COVID. He's home for the next few days. I uh, hope he gets better. Um, but it, it's not going to be where we count on the nightly news how many people have COVID. It's going to much more focus on people who get severely infected and have to go to the hospital. Those would be the numbers that we're looking at, not just the cases anymore, because that's it's just going to become a way of life and we'll have to get used to it. April, you talked about the run-up to the U.S. election. I think you said Black Lives Matter, et cetera, which obviously came through us every day in the TV. Where, where's the nation at? Is it still fairly polarized? Is it, is it coming together? And where's business at in all these standoffs? The country was very polarized after the election. You know, 74 million people voted for President Trump. It was a very, very close election. He got the most votes of any U.S. president. It is heartening to see how many people came out to vote. That's wonderful for an American to see everybody exercising their democratic duty to cast a vote. But it also means that there was a lot of acrimony um, about the new president. He has been working hard to unite people. It's been a lot quieter. There are whole days when you don't hear anything from the U.S. president now, which is different to how it was under President Trump. And on the surface, there, there seems to be less polarization. But I think there is still a deep divide in the country. Now, businesses are getting more activist. You're seeing a lot more businesses yeah. coming out on social issues, right. making statements about things that previously weren't really considered the realm of business. And now CEOs are either feeling the need themselves to speak out or feeling pressure from shareholders or from staff or from customers to take mm -hmm. a stand on issues that are important to them. So the environment now is not just about the voters, it's about the companies as well and, and where they stand. And people have said that they would be more likely to buy a product or a service from a company that aligns with their values, Keteris Paribus, you know, considering everything else being equal, yeah. they would prefer to support a company that supports their values. So it's playing into consumer choice. What's going to happen to the tax rates then? Well, during one of the presidential debates, candidate Biden said right out he would raise the corporate tax rate back up. Yep. President Trump undertook a number of stimulating measures, uh, such as decreasing the corporate tax rate, the um, one-time concessional rate to bring home foreign earned income, the opportunity zones that he created. And President Biden has said he will lift the corporate tax rate back up to 28%. That's not going to be popular with businesses. It will mean that the Australian tax rate isn't so far away from the American rate. So in terms of U.S.-Australia business relationships, that will help even things out. But it's yet to be passed, and we'll have to wait and see if businesses can afford it. They're still coming out of a severe contraction. Uh, unemployment is still recovering. The economy is still recovering. So is this really the time to increase taxes on businesses that's that waits to be decided Simple. well it's interesting times too april in the sense that we look at the globe and you've got china you've got israel you've got iran and we've got russia all doing certain things but then it comes down to who's your partner who do you trust and us and australia have gone back a long way so as little old australia down here at the bottom end of the world where do we sit in regards to the view and the friendship with the Americans? 
Australia is very connected to the United States. It started in 1918 at the Battle of Hamel on July 4th, when General Sir John Monash led American troops into battle. The first time a foreigner was given that honor, that duty, and the close alliance has continued ever since then, Australia being the only country in the world to have fought with America in every major battle since 1918. And that means a lot to Americans. You know, when you go to America and you see someone in uniform, you thank them for their service. Uh, my father is buried at Arlington Cemetery, along with many, many, many other American heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice or, or gave their lives or their supported the United States in its efforts to um, protect democracy and human rights. So we fought together in every major battle since 1918, but the real turning point for Australia came during the Second World War. Australia was part of the British Empire, and there was an understanding that Britain would protect Australia. Then came the fall of Singapore, and Australia came to realize that the United States was going to be the power that could protect Australia and Australians' freedom. And it, it has shifted and stayed that way ever since. Now, um, the Five Eyes that we have, the in intelligence community yep. that yep. includes Canada, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, and the United States, has expanded a bit. And it includes more than just intelligence now. There's the ANZUS Treaty, which is celebrating its 70th anniversary on September 1st this year. Okay. That is the only military treaty that Australia has. General Hurley, when he was governor of New South Wales, made a speech for the AmCham Academy, and he said, Australia has many friends, but only one ally. And I said to his official secretary, what does that mean? Can I quote him? He said, yes, you can, because it's, it's a fact. Australia is only allied with the United States. And the only time that alliance has been tested was right back where our conversation started, September 11th, 2001. Yeah. Prime Minister Howard was in Washington, D.C. when the United States got bombed and he invoked the ANZUS Treaty. He said, Australia will be there with you. So we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of that. But it, the alliance remains strong. It's flexible. It's, um, it's continued. 70 years is a long time for an alliance, but it still is in effect. The addition of the Quad um, yeah. and President Biden convening the first virtual meeting of the leaders of the Quad, yeah. which is Japan, India, Australia, and the United States, is also quite significant. And I think it can play an additional complementary role to these other alliances that we've talked about. So why am I reading about a report with yourself and PwC? What's the concerns? Well, I thought there was an opportunity. During COVID, remember when we couldn't get toilet paper and nobody could get pasta? All of a sudden, the rules got changed and the trucks could pull up to the Woolies and the Coles in the middle of the night and restock the shelves so that we could buy the products that we needed in the morning. Companies were allowed to trade whilst insolvent. And um, there were a lot of things that changed very quickly because yeah. they needed to during COVID. And I thought this is the time when we need to be pushing the envelope and exploring what else can be done because America is the biggest investor here, but I know we can do more. There's so much more to be done in Australia. We're the greatest of partners, the greatest of friends, and there could be a lot more business. And so they want to invest? Americans, absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're always looking for places to invest. And up until now, a lot of American companies had their regional headquarters in Hong Kong, which has its own issues, yep. and Singapore. But I thought this gave Australia a brand new opportunity to be seen as the premium destination for U.S. capital. Looking, as I said, President Trump gave that 17% one-time rate for bringing your foreign earned income back to the United States. So a lot of companies had cash reserves. They're looking around to see where growth opportunities are, and yep. Australia is a great place. So we worked with PwC. Tom Seymour led a task force of about 15 of our AmCham CEOs from all different kinds of companies talking about what they need for their bosses back in the United States. Because not only are the country heads here advocating to Canberra, saying what they need. They also have to go back to New Jersey or Florida or Chicago and say to their bosses, 
I need to hire more people. I need to build more factories. I want more investment in Australia. And they need to be able to make a case to their bosses back in the U.S. So we asked them, what are the major impediments? What's holding back more money coming to Australia? And that was what resulted in the task force report that we took to government and which has had a really positive response. Any surprises? In the report, mm. um, we were pleasantly surprised by how forthright everyone was. Mm. The opportunities uh, around the edges, really, we, we acknowledged that big things need to change. We need to have a competitive corporate tax rate. We need affordable, reliable energy. But those things are really big issues. They're going to yeah. take a lot of work and they could be very expensive to the government. Yeah. So what we wanted to do was focus on the smaller things that could be done quickly without great expense, yet still make a difference. So, for example, one of our suggestions was to rejig the fringe benefits tax yeah. to encourage more people to go out. You know, you and I were commenting how quiet the city was today. Yes. A lot of people aren't going into work every day anymore, no. but you have these small businesses in the city, the dry cleaners and the juice shops and all these little businesses that were going well when everybody was in the city Monday to Friday, but they can't survive on 60 or 80% of people coming in. If that, April. Right. You know, if people are only in three or four days a week at mm. most, yeah. a lot of these businesses are going to go under. So yeah. encouraging businesses not for big fat cat lunches with thousand dollar bottles of wine, but something modest where you take the team out for a lunch after a deal gets signed and encouraging more entertaining, a little bit like the government's done with the dine and discover vouchers, give people a reason to go out and stimulate the economy. So that was, that was one of the things that we suggested. We also talked about the foreign investment review board, yes. FERB, because uh, changes needed to be put through very quickly during COVID to protect Australia's national security with the economy in an uncertain free fall. Yep. Nobody wanted outside influences to come in and go bargain shopping in Australia while our, while our attention was focused elsewhere. So very rightly, protections were put up immediately. As we got through COVID and we started to, to see the light at the end of the tunnel, it became apparent that possibly one size doesn't fit all when you look at who's investing in your country. There are companies like the ones involved in AmCham who've been here for 100 years or 50 years and been very good corporate citizens, have employed a lot of people, contributed to the Australian economy in many ways, and wouldn't be a concern for security or intelligence reasons. And so we want to talk to FERB about recognizing trusted partners and strategic allies in different ways to the general public or even malign actors. What's been the response you've had so far? It's been very good. The treasurer uh, immediately committed to considering the proposed FERB changes alongside a review of the new foreign investment regime. Yep. We are also going to be meeting with the Foreign Investment Review Board next month. David Irvine has accepted an invitation to meet with our task force members to get together and discuss what they need. There's a real acceptance of the need for dialogue, which is extremely heartening. Can you give us some examples of the sort of companies you're talking about who actually invest in Australia, US companies, oh, and, the, and the scale of them? There are so many. It's really incredible, Greg. You know, my own children who've been born in Australia don't even know which ones are American companies um, because they've just grown up here with them. But there are thousands of American companies operating in Australia. They are employing about 350,000 people here in Australia. And those people are in high paying jobs. The median wage for people working for an American company in Australia is $115,000 a year. Right. So they're making good money. They're contributing to the economy. And that makes American companies the biggest foreign taxpayer as well. It also brings the knowledge transfer. American universities are the biggest research partner yep. with Australian universities. American companies spend over a billion dollars a year here on research and development. They, they love doing research here. Uh, a lot of the big companies would be in the resource sector, of course. Yep. Yep. Um, the uh, Chevron, Gorgon, 
um, investment was probably the biggest single investment in Australia. We also do a lot in the health sector, thankfully. I think we're all seeing the fruits of that as we come through COVID and uh, the defense sector. All of the defense primes are here. They're all members of AmCham. There is a lot of collaboration between the big American defense primes and the innovative small Australian companies. Australians are so good at innovating. Yeah. Really great inventions have come out of Australia, but we haven't quite gotten there yet on commercializing all of our inventions. And a lot of times we need to go to the U.S. for the capital and yeah. the, the scale and the growth. And we're trying to do more of that in Australia in collaboration with our American partners. What's it look like? It's looking good. There, there are some projects that are extremely exciting. The defense sector especially has, uh, like the F-35s, have 60 different Australian companies making pieces for the Joint Strike Fighters. The Boeing Loyal Wingman was developed entirely here in Australia. So oh, okay. a lot of really exceptional work that's happening here is going to benefit all of our countries. You mentioned R&D, April. Why would American companies spend all the time and effort in the other side of the world to invest in R&D in Australia? Australia has a very well-educated population. Our schools are fantastic. We are an English-speaking population. We have great healthcare system, so um, people are, are healthy and productive workers. There's patent protection. There are some countries where you can get cheaper labor or better tax rates, but you don't know who's going to own your IP. We've heard a lot of stories of people going to other countries and a week after they set up their factory, the guy down the road has all of their blueprints and is manufacturing the same thing that they have. Absolutely. There's rule of law. If there is any question, the, the courts operate similarly here. We have a double taxation treaty. Yep. We have the Osmin every year, which is where our Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense get together with the foreign minister and the defense minister, there's an ongoing dialogue between not only the president and the prime minister, but every year those four leaders get together. So it's a very close and ongoing relationship built on extreme amounts of trust. Where the world's sitting at the moment, as we sort of talked about a couple of those tensions, et cetera, do you think this is just simply just going to grow, if anything else, the whole relationship between the US and Australia? I do. I think that the current political situation in our part of the world means that the U.S. is going to rely on Australia even more than it has before. We're seeing movements. Uh, obviously, we, we touched on the changes in Hong Kong. Yeah. We're seeing possible shifts at, in Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, North Korea is an area of interest. And Australia has really led the way in so much that's important to the United States. Australia was the first one to say we will not allow our 5G network to be built by Huawei and ZTE. Yep. They were the first ones to say this is a pandemic and we want to know how it started. Australia called it out even before the WHO. So Australian leadership has really caught Americans' attention and built the respect that was already there even more. So I, I would say we're going to see additional investment, but also additional political connections. Okay. All sounds good, but we know not everybody's coming here because of the big picture stuff you were talking about earlier. Tax rates, red tape. Why aren't we being smarter about it, April? Because otherwise, aren't I going to spend my time in Singapore? There are a lot of reasons to come to Australia. Obviously, your employees are going to be happier living in Australia than almost anywhere else in the region. And one of the big impediments before was a lot of American business people said, oh, I need to set up in Singapore because my employees need to be within a three-hour flight of any place that they're dealing with. Yeah. The silver lining of COVID is that even my grandmother knows how to use Zoom now. Everybody is connected via the Zoom and, and other WebEx and all these platforms. So I think it's more important now to be in the same time zone than to be within a 90-minute flight of someplace. You know, nobody wants to be in Perth talking to New York on a Zoom call. So being in a similar time zone, we're only two hours different to Beijing here. We, we're in the right part of the world. And if you can set up part of your regional hub here in Australia, it'll be easier to 
uh, attract the talent. People want to live here. For example, in the United States, when we saw Oracle, HP, and Tesla all move from California to Texas, yep. I was asking somebody, but what about all the engineers? They don't live in Texas. How are they going to find the people they need? And she said, they'll move there. If that's where the jobs are, they'll move there. So if we can get the jobs here, people will, will come to Australia and the uh, global talent attraction scheme, trying to, to bring groups of talented workers in yep. once COVID is under control, that will help bring people over in the right um, sectors where we need them to build up the capacity. Likewise, um, Australians going to the United States have a, a special kind of way to enter. But I think that the, the benefits of being in Australia have ballooned thanks to COVID. It's seen as a safe place to be. You've seen um, Hollywood has moved to the harbor side. Everybody has movie stars hanging out in their local chicken shops and, and at the beach. Um, the producers love working here. It's creating great benefits for the additional parts of the economy, the people who build the sets, who cater for the sets, who drive the actors around. All of that is is really beneficial. And uh, I think we could see other other groups relocating to Australia once they discover what a good place it is. We've seen a lot of the multi-billionaires setting up doomsday bunkers in New Zealand. I think they could see Australia as a great place to set up their businesses. Are we marketing ourselves in the right manner? You've got the state versus the federal government. Doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes, does it? There, there are a few different levels to that. You know, I think um, most Americans have Australia at the top of their bucket list of places they want to go but mostly for a holiday. They know about Bondi Beach and they've they've heard about the Great Barrier Reef. Now they know about Byron. Um, so they want to visit here. They might not necessarily think of it as a place to do business. So I think we need to work harder on marketing ourselves as a great business destination. Yeah. And Premier Berejiklian was talking about that last week at an AmCham event where she talked about Invest New South Wales, this new concierge service yeah. that the state has set up. And that's the kind of thing that we really need to attract the investment. There are a lot of premiers who are working very hard. Stephen Marshall has done an amazing job bringing business to South Australia. Anastasia Palaszczuk has worked very hard um, to bring American business. Some of the other premiers aren't as focused on the United States as they are in other countries, but they're all looking for investment. And um, as you said, the, the state versus federal is the other layer of complexity. And when you go to something like bio in Boston, the big bio show, you don't need to see the Victoria tent and the Queensland tent and the New South Wales tent. Honestly, Americans think Queensland is someplace in England. They, they don't know the names of our states. I yeah. didn't know the names of our states before I got here. They just want to see Team Australia. Yeah. So I think we should all try and work together to bring the investment to Australia. And then once they get to Australia, sure, fight it out. Tell them about the great things in your state. But let's just convince them to come to the Southern Hemisphere to get to the antipodes in the first place and then figure out where the best place is to set up their business. I think if we all united more when we're overseas, you know, they used to say politics stops at the water's edge. I think we should keep that in mind for business. We shouldn't each be out there spruiking overseas. Get them interested in Australia, get them here, and then figure out where the best place is for them to set up. I'm also a little bit surprised when we look pre-COVID and during COVID, as you say, Australia's a great destination. And Americans are known for being willing to travel for work. Australians less so, as we all know. How hard is it for an American who's got great skills and a young family to make the call to come to Australia based on our visa system? It used to be easier. I came here under 457, which converted into permanent residency and we're now citizens. It is much harder to get senior executives to agree to move to Australia if they're only offered a two-year visa. Why would they? Because people that in your field, when yep. you're recruiting yep. very senior people, typically they do have a spouse, a family. So you're not just asking them to give up their career and move to a new country. You're asking the spouse and the children to do so as well. And if there's not a path to citizenship, it's a very hard call to make to say, yes, I'm willing to to even diplomats get three years when they come to Australia. Two years is, is a very short amount of time. So 
we need to be sure that if these are skilled migrants who are in the fields where we need human knowledge and technical skills and they can be additive, that we welcome them. We've seen a really big brain gain, kind of the opposite of a brain drain. We've seen a brain gain during COVID with all the expats who wanted to come back because Australia was safe. They've been living and working overseas and they wanted to come back here. We want to keep them, but we also want to bring more people over to, to fill the gaps that we have and make us a stronger, faster economy. Are you having much success in that dialogue? Yeah, absolutely. There is a task force that has been set up with Peter Verwo trying to bring groups of talented people over here. And there is a recognition that Australia still needs to bring these people in. It's more complicated now during COVID, of course. A lot of them in the tech sector would come from the United States or maybe India, two yes. countries that have been very hard hit during COVID. Yep. Um, but as things get back to normal, I would hope to see more of that. But we, we don't have a special visa for Americans, which is something I would like to see. When you first came here, now you've had 18 years here, how do you think business leaders or business is perceived in this country versus US? I noticed a few differences. I thought Australia was a little bit behind on diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we were looking at a lot more than just gender. You know, here it's still how many women are in the ASX. It's It's been that conversation for 20 years as far as I can tell. Whereas in America, there were a lot more factors that you looked at. You take a business card from a small business owner and they proudly display this is a veteran-owned, minority-owned, female-led business. They, they talk about lots of different factors in yeah. their diversity and government procurement requirements insist on you having certain elements of diversity in your supply chain. So it's something that I think Australia has uh, worked harder on and it's it's evolving, but yep. the veterans side of things I, I'm still pushing on. I think the United States still works a lot harder to get veterans into the private sector, into productive, useful roles, um, both that help the economy and that also help the mental health of people who've separated from the military because that, that high suicide rate happens in the first 12 months when they leave the military and they don't feel they have a purpose. So if we can work with our companies to help, as soon as the people decide to leave the military, help understand what their skills are, translate those skills. Like how does a sharpshooter fit into my warehouse? What skills does he or she have? Yeah. Not specifically what does he know how to do, but what kinds of problem solving does he bring and, and project management and those kinds of things and try and help them translate. So one of the things that we did at AmCham was try to get our companies to sign a pledge to give a vet a go. And that meant interviewing any veterans who were qualified for open positions, giving them a go. Because a lot of veterans have said to us, gosh, I've been in the military for 30 years. I, have, I haven't had an interview since I was 18. So they don't know. That's where they say they're lacking skills. Yep to explain what they do, to, to talk to people. And so the more companies that agree to interview veterans, the more they can build up those skills and develop the conversations that will help them move into the private sector. So that, that's one of the areas where I think Australian and American businesses can learn from each other. The other thing I was thinking about, uh, April, was more around the mindset of willing and wanting to do business. Now, Americans are entrepreneurial. I've heard you talk about people investing in entrepreneurs and they failed a couple of times and I'm going to continue in that investment because you proudly have failed. Now you're going to make it into something, right? Whereas Australia, we're in the gutter and we're walked over because you failed, right? Very different, very different culture in the sense, I want business to be successful because I'm going to get employed as a result. Do you notice much in that sort of difference in the discussion? Yeah, yeah, I do definitely. And I know you've employed several Americans in your firm, so you see that also. Everybody in the U.S. has a side hustle going on. It's just that's what you do and you expect it to fail and you start another one and you start another one until you have something that works. One of the most discouraging conversations I have in Australia is when I say, well, this, this was tried and then I hear the rejoinder, 
oh, well, you saw how that worked out, yeah. as if that's kind of the end of the discussion, whereas I see it as the beginning of the discussion. Well, that's one way that's not going to work. What are the other six ways we're going to try to get where we need to go? Because it's an iterative process. And that's why we've taken these innovation missions to the United States. What are they? That's where we go and look at the innovation culture. We go to Silicon Valley or Seattle or San Francisco or Boston or Austin and look at how companies think about innovation and that you can invest in a hundred companies with the idea that maybe one is going to come good. You don't invest in one, see it fail, and then say, oh, I'm not going to invest in anybody anymore. You, you have to look at a whole portfolio of companies with the idea that maybe one is going to be successful. So we've tried to take people behind the scenes in the United States to hear from leaders about the risks they've taken, the culture that has developed. How do you keep the innovative culture in a big company? When you take over a small company, how do you not kill it? You have to sequester them and keep them thinking innovatively and creatively, keep them hungry. If you have too many resources, you're never going to invent anything. I think that the scarcity that's been brought about by COVID is, is another great opportunity to lead to more innovation. I'm going to throw one at you, April. I think you and I agree on this, but a lot of people won't say it. Innovation. Am I really going to innovate working from home, April? Or am I going to innovate as a team back together, bouncing ideas? There's been a lot of disruption in the workforce necessarily because of the health challenges of having people together in an office. But data set after data set shows us that the only time new things happen is when people are together. They don't happen on a Zoom platform. They happen in front of a whiteboard or around a coffee table or in the hallway or on a bus. It's when people are together bouncing ideas off of each other that the new ideas develop and innovation happens. So we've got to find a way to continue to bring people together while maintaining this new um, workplace flexibility that so many people have come to enjoy and don't want to give up. But we can't just all stay in our houses all the rest of our lives and, and work from home. We need to bring people together and cross-pollinate and create new ideas. Not hearing a lot of leaders in Australia say that, April. There's a desire to keep people safe, um, first sure. and foremost. Okay. Nobody wants to endanger their employees. So we need to be sure it's a, a safe environment to get people back. And the flexibility that people have had during COVID to be able to uh, read the newspaper or throw in a, a load of washing or, or run out to the post office while you're in your working day has really sparked people to, um, to enjoy that flexibility. But there's going to be a point where leaders are, are going to be a bit more prescriptive about, we've got all this office space, we expect you to be here this amount of days, and we need the senior leaders here to teach the younger people. I've hired people that I haven't even met yet. I've yeah. hired them completely remotely. And really hard for them to know what we're about, to understand our culture. If they just sit at home by themselves doing their work, they need to be in, they need to be learning. And the only way to develop that culture and to mentor and to create new leaders is to be together. So if I'm a senior American business person and I'm looking to double my returns, et cetera, and I'm expanding and I look all the way down and I maybe have a phone call of you, April, and you suggest, look, there's opportunities here in Australia. And I know Australia has been renowned for digging holes, right? Great exports around the world. What am I investing in down here, April? What are the new markets that Australia should be seriously thinking about, given your experience, what Americans are looking for? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We're known for holes and homes, right? The property and resources. The new areas that we're looking at, one of the key ones is critical minerals, rare earths. These deposits that aren't actually all that rare, but are hard to get out of the ground and, and process in order to use. But we need them for everyday life, for our computer chips and for our airplanes and, and for all of our technology. And right now, most of that is controlled by two countries, China and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So to the extent that the US and Australia can collaborate on these critical minerals. Um, one of our companies, Jervois Mining, is putting um, together a cobalt mine in Idaho 
similarly, Linus is doing some great work in Texas. So that's one area where I would say Australians and Americans can collaborate. I think um, the energy transition is another one. We've done such amazing work here with resources and the innovation that's come about because of our landmass. The remote robotics that have been developed in the mining sector and also for our agriculture to benefit the Australian people through um, drones and robots and automation, all of that can be used yeah. as we move into the energy transition and find new sources of energy and renewables and, and all of that. We're an innovative country with some of the best engineers in the resource sector. So those are the people who are going to be able to work closely with the United States to move forward on clean energy and ESG. Are we seen as a smart nation? We are. We are. I know that the Harvard study that came out recently said we had a dumb economy because it's yeah. not complex. It's based on very basic exports. But the people are seen as very clever, collaborative, highly principled. So there's a lot of opportunity to work with Americans. Americans definitely respect Australians, see them as loyal and hardworking. Yeah. Bigger opportunities. You mentioned the quad mm. and the eyes. Mm. Can you talk us through what's that going to mean in terms of, do you think, relationships, right, as opposed to trade deals? Where do you see the difference in that regard, mm -hmm. the impact for Australia? Well, Minister Tian has said we're very close on a trade deal with the UK. So that's that's part of Five Eyes. We already have one with the United States. The US-Australia Free Trade Agreement was signed 15 years ago. So that's um, that's already very much in place. The the difference with Five Eyes is that it's it's moving from just being an intelligence resource to expanding more into defense and other sectors. The Quad is never going to be just about defense. That's, that's about other opportunities. And um, we could even see other partners adding in to the Quad, like, like NATO has plug-in partners. Mm -hmm. um, we, we could see that expanding somewhat. But I think that the approach that the Biden administration is taking to rejoin Paris, to, um, to reignite the Quad, to engage in Five Eyes, there are a lot of multilateral efforts that President Biden is more comfortable with than President Bush. President Bush much, and President Trump uh, much preferred the bilateral agreements because he thought he could get a better deal for the United States if he was just negotiating against one country rather than a group. But we've seen President Biden is, is much more comfortable with the multilateral. And so the Five Eyes and the Quad, I think, will continue to gain in importance. Are we playing it pretty smart as a country? Because we've got to obviously work with the Americans and keep the Chinese close as well. Hard one to navigate. It is, and the Prime Minister is doing all that he can to um, stand up for Australian principles, keep Australian people safe, keep the economy going, stay close to our ally, the United States, and keep the Australian economy strong. It is, you're right, it is a very tough question, and, and our leaders are doing all that they can to ride both horses. You're a busy lady. You're out most nights of the week. What's the day in the life look like for you? I'm really fortunate. We have several hundred companies as members and hundreds of thousands of people working in those companies. So it's companies, not people? That's right. Yeah. The, the members of AmCham are companies or, or organizations and then whoever works for those companies can take the benefits of the chamber, but it's the company that's the member. So um, I get invited to all kinds of different events. I get to look inside how other organizations are thinking about important topics. We, we mentioned ESG recently. That's, that's a big one. Matthias Corman has been making the rounds, talking about how Australia is going to be engaged in OECD when he takes over there. So I spend most of my days going to uh, speeches, having meetings with members. My favorite thing is to go out to a member's place of business. So I love driving out or walking, if it's in the city, going out to where they work, seeing how they're set up. Not only meeting their employees, but seeing what posters do they have on the wall? What kinds of awards do they display that they're proud of? Um, I went out to Stryker 
and oh, yeah. in St. Leonard's, and they were voted the best place to work. Is that right? So I wanted to go and see what's it like at the best place to work. PwC just got that award for consulting this year, and that's one of the things that I enjoy the most, seeing how they operate, what they do, what their employees think is important, what their challenges are. That's the part that I like the best. Um, we have five offices, as I said, so we're trying to run events and service our membership in five very different parts of the country. Of mm -hmm. course, our office in Perth deals with different issues to the ones in Adelaide and yep. the ones in Queensland. So trying to stay on top of how we can help companies in all those different parts of the country is an important part of my job. And we have um, very influential councils of governors in all of the states. Um, Mrs. Reinhardt leads the Council of Governors in WA, Christopher Pine in South Australia, Carl Morris in Queensland. Here in New South Wales, it's um, Rob LaBusque, who runs Verizon, and in Melbourne, Jean Johns, who's the head of Inside Tech Pivot. So calling on all of those governor's councils for ideas about where we should be going, what are their companies concerned about, where do they see the opportunities, I'm just drinking from a fire hose every day, and I love it. You've also got a glimpse that most people don't have, um, going back all those years ago, working under a president and some very, very senior people during, as you say, a time of crisis, which was war. What's a good leader look like to you? Good leaders think about the future, that they're not just concerned with today's events. They are thinking about what their actions will mean a year down the road, five years down the road, how it's going to impact other parts of their business, their partners, their customers, and really take the long view. Leaders lead. The, the difference that I've seen is that there are managers and there are leaders. And good management is important. We've been very lucky to have a lot of good management during COVID. You, you need people who follow procedures and, and are good managers. But a, a truly great leader is somebody who doesn't take his or her steps based on a popularity poll or whatever the, the populace is saying at the moment, but thinks ahead about what needs to be done and takes a stand on it, whether it's popular or not, but actually leads the country or the company where it needs to go. And what did you say your mother of four? So you're going to be a leader at home. How do you balance this all up? It's a big gig you've got here, April. Well, I have a great husband. I think all of these challenges wouldn't be possible without a great partner and fantastic school system here. I'm really, really happy with the Australian school system and what we've been able to get out of it. And the community around us, we've been lucky enough to have really good influences on our children, whether it's through the running community, which they spend a lot of time in, churches, schools, outdoor activities. Uh, they say that you are a combination of the five people you spend the most time with. And so surrounding yourself with people whose values you agree with, whose leadership you trust and admire, that's the best way to um, get the best out of your family, your employees, and yourself. What's success for you, April? I feel like I'm successful every day. Every day is a new opportunity to be successful, and I like to go home, get, get into bed feeling like I can actually tick off the things that mattered, that I accomplished things, that I wasn't just spinning my wheels. Obviously, the P&L matters a lot, and um, for, for all leaders, you, you need to make sure that's where it should be, but when, yeah. once you get the basics down, then whether it's it's growing a vegetable garden or raising a child or turning around a company, feeling like you set out to do something and you can measure the accomplishment is, is a good feeling. And you have to do that every day. Otherwise, you might just feel like you're drowning because there's always more to do. But if you reflect on what you've gotten done and what remains to be seen, you can start to mark it off and, and see the progress that you're making. So if you were to look back at that young lady who was in the back of what, a C-130, bullets flying through, lights turned off, landing into a foreign country, into a war zone, what advice would you give her now? Keep taking chances. I had no idea I would wind up flying into Afghanistan in a Hercules. Just take every opportunity that comes at you. My son is, is in law school and he's working at a law firm right now. 
And he said, mom, I put my hand up for everything. If they need somebody to go down and pick up lunch, I do it. If they need somebody to go and file a brief, I do it. If they need somebody to post bail, I put my hand up. Take every opportunity that comes at you and you never know where it's going to lead. Don't say no to anything. If you can fit it in, if you can stay awake for an hour longer, if you can drive an, an extra 10 kilometers, whatever you need to do to, to fit in those opportunities, take them all because you don't know where they're going to lead or what's lying ahead of you. And if you don't try, yes, you'll never fail, but you're never going to grow. You're never going to have fantastic opportunities in front of you and wonderful successes that are possible. On that, April, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to No Limitations.